Hello, everyone. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming Kotaro Tsuboyama to our seminar series. Um, we have three talks in the next few weeks focusing on generation of high throughput data sets and what that could mean for machine learning models. So Kotaro today will be joining us um, from the University of Tokyo and presenting uh, his work on meta mega scale experimental analysis of protein folding stability in biology and protein design. Uh, Kotaro. Uh, thanks so much for kind introduction. And um, it's honor to talk about my project in this seminar. So I'm Kotaro uh, from the University of Tokyo. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the uh, high throughput analysis of folding stability of proteins. But I need to say that I have done this project at Rockland Lab in Northwestern University. Uh, so first, I'd like to talk about what the folding stability of protein is and why this is so important. So uh, basically, the amino acid sequence of a protein defines structure and structure defines function. So this is very basic principle of proteins. For example, GFP or green for instance protein has this kind of beta barrier structure and inside the structure, uh, there is a chromophore. So that's why we could see that this kind of green fluorescence from this protein. But the, uh, the structure of GFP looks very static, but actually this is not true. The almost all proteins in the equation between unfolded and folded state. And basically the folding stability uh, represents the uh, defined equilibrium between unfolded and folded state. And if um, uh, so, the folding stability is very, very important features or for the function or properties of proteins. Because if one protein is in unfolded state, they should lose its proper function. And they are prone to be aggregated or are easily degraded inside the cells. So understanding of the folding stability is very, very important features for proteins. And for example, the folding stability directly affects enzymatic activity of proteins. So the PET hydrase was recently identified, and this enzyme can degrade PET into monomer. So this enzyme should be very crucial for recycling of the plastic photos. But unfortunately, the white PET hydrase activity was not so high as expected. But we can introduce several mutations so that we can obtain the improved version of PET hydrase. And indeed, the improved and stabilized version of PET hydrase uh, show much higher activity uh, compared to the white PET hydrase. So in general, the more stable the protein is, more active. So understanding of the folding stability is also very important for the enhancing enzymatic activity of proteins. And also we can now design the novel proteins that are useful for biology or medicine. Of course, evolution has been designing so many natural proteins, but we can also design the novel proteins using computation power. And as our researchers have been designing many de novo proteins, but unfortunately, the success rate of the de novo protein design was around 50% or less. The major cause of the failure is low folding stability because low folding stability causes low expression level, uh, low stability or aggregation of proteins. So if we could establish a new model uh, for predicting of the folding stability more accurately, we should be able to improve the success rate of the de novo protein design. And also, I'd like to uh, talk about alpha fold very briefly. So as you may know, alpha fold can now predict the protein structure very, very accurately. So I'm now showing you the two examples. And the green one represents the uh, structures uh, solved in X-ray crystallography. And blue means the uh, structure predicted by alpha fold 2. And as you can see, these two models are almost perfectly identical, uh, which means that alpha fold 2 can now predict the protein structure with amazing accuracy. But unfortunately, this uh, alpha fold tool is not so useful in de novo protein design. So for example, Tayo and me uh, designed de novo protein with this kind of alpha, beta, beta, alpha topology. And we also quantified the folding stability of these structures using the HG spray method, uh, gave already kind of published in 2017. And uh, based on the stability score, uh, we split the designs into three groups, from unstable ones to stable ones. And then we utilize alpha for two to predict their structure. But unfortunately, alpha for two predicted almost identical structure for these three groups, which means that uh, alpha for two couldn't kind of discriminate the stable designs from unstable ones. 
this result further suggests that this alpha for two is not so useful in de novo protein design. So the question is why we can't predict folding stability very accurately. The short answer is we don't have any good data set on folding stability. So for example, DeepMind utilized a protein data bank or PDB that includes around 200,000 structures uh, to construct a deep learning alpha fold prediction model. Of course, there is a, a database on stability called Profam, for example, but the Profam only includes around 30,000 stabilities. So the data set, the size of the data set is somewhat smaller than PDB. And also the database is somewhat biased. I mean, the most of the data is the folding stability change when we replace the Y type amino acid with alanine. So of course this kind of derived from the, obviously derived from the uh, alanine scanning. And also the experimental condition is uh, totally different from paper to paper, like pH, ion concentration, uh, temperature or denaturant. So it is somewhat difficult to handle the uh, data set in kind of one way. So taken together, the database on folding stability is somewhat unreliable compared to the uh, PDB or other databases. Oh, so, so the long-term goal of my project is to construct a general model for predicting of the folding stability of proteins more accurately. But to this end, we need to collect a huge data set on protein folding stability for training and testing of the prediction model. Then the question is, um, how can we get such an enormous amount of protein stability data uh, to construct a general model? So we developed a new method to quantify the folding stability of proteins in a very high manner. So to achieve this, we utilize CDNA display method, which is kind of all in vitro method. So in this method, we can conjugate protein with corresponding CDNA or complementary DNA to mRNA. And importantly, this conjugation uh, is direct and covalent. So this conjugation remains intact even under very harsh conditions, such as very high temperature or very low or very high pH. And also, uh, more importantly, this CDNA is always attached to the C terminal to the protein uh, while the translation step. So we added the PA tag on the end terminal for the purification of the protein. And then we utilize proteins such as trypsin or chymotrypsin to quantify the folding stability proteins. So basically the protein can only cleave this kind of unfolded region or unfolded state. So the protein cannot cleave straight stable structure very easily, while proteins can quickly cleave unstable structure. So that's why we could kind of quantify the folding stability by just observing the cleavage rate by proteases. And after protein digestion, uh, we collected cDNA corresponding to intact proteins using PATAG antibody and magnet feeds. And this is because the PATAG is located at end terminal of the protein, uh, while the cDNA is always attached to the C terminals of the protein. And then we utilize next generation sequencing to analyze which protein remain intact, uh, which protein remain intact after protein digestion. So using cDNA display method, uh, protein and uh, next generation sequencing we can quantify the folding stability of proteins in a very high manner. Uh, so in actual screening, uh, we, we first ordered DNA or EGO library, which includes up to around 800 or 900,000 sequences. And then we uh, prepare a protein and cDNA complex using cDNA display method. And then we expose such kind of complex to several concentrations of proteins. And then we collected cDNA and its corresponding, uh, sorry, the intact protein and its corresponding cDNA using PATAG antibody and magnetic beads. And then we utilize NGS to identify which protein remain intact after protein digestion. So here's the actual result. Um, so the, uh, as I said, the, we expose the complex to the several concentrations of proteases. So in this plot, x-axis represents the uh, concentration of trypsin, and y-axis represents the relative sequencing counts normalized to the no-protein sample. So for example, the blue uh, protein is kind of very unstable. So the fraction of the uh, blue protein, protein was decreased even at the kind of middle range of the protein concentration. But uh, uh, in contrast, the red protein is very stable. The, the fraction of the red protein was increased as the protein concentration goes up. So using this kind of data, we can infer the folding stability on proteins in a very accurate manner. Uh, so to validate our new method, uh, we compared our data uh, with the uh, folding stabilities uh, previously measured. 
So for example, the, this PNS paper uh, measured uh, the folding stabilities of 800 mutants of protein G using this chemical denaturation method. And as you may know, this chemi uh, chemical denaturation method is one of the kind of golden standard method to quantify the folding stability of proteins. Uh, so we uh, compared our data with the folding stability from the PNS paper. And we could see kind of very high consistency between these two data sets, uh, which means that our data, uh, our assay can accurately quantify the folding stability of proteins. And, but please note that around 800 mutants of protein G are actually included in around 700,000 sequences in our assay. So the accuracy is almost comparable between our assay and previous method, but the throughput of our analysis is much, much higher than others. And also we could see kind of this kind of high consistency for 10 different domains, regardless of the topology of the uh, structures. So which means that we can quantify the folding stability of proteins in a very high manner in a very accurate way. Uh, so we developed a new method to quantify the folding stability of proteins in a very, uh, in a very accurately and in a very high manner. And uh, so the next step would be to construct a general model for predicting of the folding stability using this kind of huge data set. But we are developing such a general model. So in this talk, I'd like to focus on what we can learn from the huge data set. So first, I'd like to talk about the relationship between the amino acid fitness and the environmental factors. So basically, we quantified the folding stability uh, for comprehensive single mutants for around 550 natural and de uh, designed proteins using the CDNA display proteolysis method. So I'm now showing you one example. Uh, so in this heat map, x-axis represents the, each position of the domain, and y-axis represents the mutated amino acid. And of course, each color represents the folding stability. So white means the white folding stability, and red and blue means the stabilized and destabilizing mutant. And uh, each dot represents the, each amino acid, uh, each white type amino acid for each position. So using this kind of data set, we investigated how the amino acid fitness is defined. So basically using this kind of data set, we have kind of this kind of high dimension data set uh, with the kind of 20 by amino acid length in terms of the dimension. So it is somewhat difficult to analyze this kind of huge data, uh, high dimension data. So we want to complex such high dimension data in low dimension data uh, using PCA or a principal component analysis. And then I would like to talk about uh, each of the PC. So first I would like to talk about PC1, uh, which is the most important principal component. And as you may know, the advantage of the PCA is that we can kind of quantify the contribution to the, uh, of the contribution of the 20 amino acid to each of the PC. So for example, in this case, isoleucine, valine, and leucine show positive values. On the other hand, aspartate, glycine, and aspartate show negative values. So the, from this result, we could see that PC1 should represent the preference to hydrophobicity. And also we investigated what kind of environmental factors is related to this PC1. And indeed we could see kind of very nice uh, correlation between PC1 and the uh, number of the side chain contacts. And also we could see that in the structure, uh, the residue at the core region show positive values. Uh, on the other hand, the residue on the surface show negative values. So uh, this result suggests that uh, PC1 basically represents the preference to the hydrophobic amino acids, and they are highly related to the number of the side chain contacts. And then I would like to talk about PC2 and 3. And in PC2, we could pr uh, clearly see that the pro uh, PC2 should represent the preference to proline. And indeed, the, this PC2 is also highly correlated the uh, fraction of the loop structure. And this is reasonable because proline tend to destroy the heresies or strands. So this is good. And in PC3, we could see aromatic amino acids show positive values, while the uh, aquatic amino acids such as valine or isoleucine so show negative values. And indeed, the PC3 is correlated with the uh, number of the side chain contacts of aromatic amino acids. So the PC3 basically represents the preference to aromatic amino acids versus aliphatic amino acids. And this result suggests that the aromatic amino acids tend to be clustered in several regions rather than spreading out for the whole regions. 
This is probably because the aromatic amino acid can form a pi stacking interaction between them. And then I would like to talk about PC4 and 5 together. So in PC4, we could see basic amino acids such as arginine or lysine show negative values. Uh, on the other hand, in PC5, we could see that uh, acidic amino acids such as aspartate or glutamate show negative values. And also we could see that PC4 is anti-correlated with the uh, number of the acidic amino acid side chain contacts. And PC5 is also anti-correlated with the number of the basic amino acid side chain contacts. So these results are kind of very reasonable. But more interestingly, we could see that in both of the PC4 and 5, the small amino acids such as arnine and glycine uh, show positive values. So this means that at least in the terms of the kind of fitness of amino acid, the opposite side of the charged amino acid is actually the small amino acid rather than differently charged amino acid. So this is somewhat kind of unexpected result before analyzing this kind of data set. And then I'd like to talk about the divergence between the wider amino acids and the best amino acid in terms of the folding subunit. So using the exact same data set, uh, we investigated the relationship between the folding stability and wild type amino set in natural domains. So first I'd like to show you the relationship between the folding stability and relative usage of amino acid. So basically we could see kind of positive correlation. And indeed, uh, if one amino acid can stabilize a protein by around like one kick up or more, that amino acid are more likely to be wild type amino acid by around six times. So this is kind of not so surprising result, but uh, this is actually the first time to accurately quantify the relationship between the folding stability and relative usage of amino acid using this kind of huge data set. And then using this kind of data, we can also quantify the amino acid usage bias after excluding the effect of this kind of folding stability uh, onto the protein. So in other words, I'm now showing you the amino acid usage bias when we assume that all of the 20 amino acids can achieve the exact same folding stability of proteins. So for example, we could see that acidic amino acids such as glutamate and aspartate and lysine uh, uh, are more likely to be wild type, while the uh, aromatic amino acids, especially tryptophan, are less likely to be wild type amino acids in natural domains. And this result are uh, kind of very reasonable because the, uh, if uh, uh, natural domain includes so many hydrophobic amino acids, they, they lose its uh, proper solubility on the actual environment. And also the synthesis cost of the aromatic amino acid is much, much higher than that of the others. So uh, basically natural domain should avoid usage of a hydrophobic amino acid, especially, hydropho uh, especially aromatic amino acid if possible. And then also I'd like to talk about the uh, identification method of the functional sites within natural domain, just using the uh, folding stability data and the evolution conservation. So using the same data set, we can kind of quantify the preference to white up amino acid for each domain. So for example, at this site, the replacement of this isoloysin with others largely destabilized the protein. So which means that this site should have strong preference to the white up amino acids. In contrast, uh, when we replace uh, this aspartate with other, uh, glutamate with others, it has almost no effect on folding stability, which means that this uh, white up amino acid is kind of weakly preferred at this region. So this is how we can quantify how strong the white up amino acid is preferred for each site, for each domain. And then I would like to show you the preference to the white up amino uh, the relationship between the preference to the white up amino acid in terms of the folding stability and the evolution and conservation uh, for around uh, 6,000 sites in around 100 non-redundant natural domains. So basically we could see the kind of positive correlation between these two features, which means that if one, I mean, if one site is strongly has strong preference to the white up amino acids in terms of the folding stability, they are highly evolution conserved. And again, this is not so surprising result, but what is more interesting is we could see many sites are concentrated in this uh, top left area. They are not so important for the folding stability, but they are highly evolution concept. So we want to investigate what kind of sites are concentrated in this top left area. So uh, to explain this, I want to uh, focus on this HP1 chroma domain. So I'm now highlighting four residues that are located in this top left area. And actually this HP1 chroma domain can interact with uh, very strongly and specifically interact with the uh, histone H3 tail 
with trimethylated lysine residues. And interestingly, three out of uh, four uh, orange residues are very close to that trimethylation. So, and indeed, those three uh, residues are very important for the recognition of that trimethylation on lysine. So, uh, which means that those orange residues are very important for the function of the HB1 chromosome domain. So we are now thinking that the, those orange residues, I mean the top left area, residue in this kind of top left area, are more likely to be functional compared to the others. And that's why we, uh, those residues are not so important for the folding stability, but they are highly evolution concept. And also I'd like to show you another example, uh, which is SSO7D protein. And this protein includes many orange residues. Uh, I mean, uh, that's are located in this top left area. And indeed, this protein is kind of DNA binding protein. And we could see that many of the orange residues are on the interface with the DNA. So this result also supports that uh, those orange residues are more likely to be functional compared to the others. And so uh, using just using the preference to the white up amino set and evolution in conservation, we can relatively easy to narrowing down the uh, functional sites within natural domains. So this kind of method would be very useful to identify the function or identify the functional sites within the kind of natural domains, or especially for the unclassified domains. And then lastly, I would like uh, to talk about, I would like to talk about the uh, thermodynamic couplings between two or more amino acids. So first I would like to talk about what the thermodynamic couplings are. So let's say there are two amino acids without any interaction within one domain. So in this case, there are no time and coupling between uh, them because the, the interaction between them has no effect on the folding stability of proteins. By contrast, if two amino acids form this kind of hydrogen bone or hydrophobic amino acid, there should be a positive permanent coupling because the interaction between them can stabilize the protein. In contrast, if two amino acids causes this kind of strict hindrance, there should be a negative permanent coupling because the interaction between them has a negative effect on folding stability of proteins. So to quantify such uh, thermodynamic coupling, we performed a comprehensive double mutational analysis for around 400 amino acid pairs. And I'm now showing you one example. So for this amino acid pair, we quantified the uh, folding stability of uh, 400 comprehensive double mutants of this amino acid pair. And I'm now showing you the result in this heat map. And white color represents the white folding stability and blue means the destabilizing mutant. And to keep the folding stability, for example, the site 10 need to be aromatic amino acids, while the site 52 can accept the many of them. And then to accurately quantify the thermodynamic couplings, uh, we constructed an additive model where we assume there are no thermodynamic couplings. So the uh, Y equals X uh, should represent the uh, without any uh, thermodynamic couplings since the Y axis represents the observed delta G. So for example, the Y type amino acid pair, including two tyrosines is located above Y equals X line, which means that the interaction between two tyrosines can stabilize the protein. But we could also see that histidine and lysine pair is also located above Y equals X line. So which means that the interaction between histidine and lysine can stabilize the protein. So to know what happens in the mutant, uh, we want to uh, utilize the alpha 4 2 So in the white type structure, of course, there are two tyrosines, and they can uh, form the pi stacking or hydrophobic interaction. So that's why we could see around one kg per more uh, positive thermodynamic coupling. Uh, in the mutants uh, of the histidine and lysine, uh, there are newly formed hydrogen bond between histidine and lysine residues. And they actually form the large hydrogen bond network along with aspartate and glutamate. And this kind of large hydrogen bond network can stabilize the protein. So that's why we could see kind of larger positive thermodynamic couplings between histidine and lysine residues. So using this kind of comprehensive data set, we can uh, we successfully find out uh, this kind of unexpected positive thermodynamic couplings between two amino acids. And then I would like to expand this kind of analysis for triples, I mean the three amino acid combination. But first, I'd like to focus on tyrosine and arginine. So again, we uh, quantify the folding stability of 400 comprehensive double mutants of the tyrosine and arginine pair. And we also constructed an additive model. And by doing so, we could see that tyrosine, arginine, or lysine residues are located above Y equals X line. 
So this is probably because they can form cation pi interaction between them. Uh, the cation pi interaction can be formed between the aromatic amino acids and basic amino acids. And this kind of cation pi interaction can stabilize the protein. But more interestingly, when we mutated the third amino acid, I mean aspartate 64 with alanine, we couldn't see any positive thermodynamic couplings uh, even for the white up amino acid pair, which means that the thermodynamic coupling between the tyrosine and arginine also depends on the third amino acid, in this case, aspartate 64. So this result further suggests that interaction between tyrosine, arginine, and aspartate are crucial for, uh, is crucial for the folding stability of the domains. Uh, so using this kind of huge data set, we can successfully identify this kind of very interesting case in protein science. And then I would like to also talk about the global tendency of the amino acid compatibility uh, using the huge data set. So uh, we just calculated the average of the thermodynamic couplings for around 400 amino acid pairs. And red means the positive thermodynamic couplings and blue means negative ones. So we could see the positive thermodynamic coupling between acidic amino acid and basic amino acid. They can just form the uh, short bridges. And also this is true for the uh, two cysteines because they can form the isoplanet bond. And also we could see positive thermodynamic couplings between uh, the uh, basic amino acid and the aromatic amino acid. In contrast, we could see negative thermodynamic couplings between two basic amino acids and two acidic amino acids. And also we can confirm the, uh, confirm the uh, acidic amino acid is like the hydrophobic amino acids. So using this kind of huge data set, we successfully uh, confirmed the amino acid compatibility shown in the previous literature. So we successfully developed a new method to quantify the folding stability of proteins in a very accurate manner in a very high speed. So using this data set, we are now constructing a general model for predicting of the folding stability of proteins in a very accurate way. So lastly, I would like to thank EME Corporation for providing us with CNVK Linker. This is vital for seasonal display method and the USC and Rush University are helping us to perform NGS. And of course, I would like to thank Abe Rockin, of course, for great supervision and all Rockin Lab members. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to take any question right now. Yeah, thank Hello. you so much. If anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute and ask questions. Hey, Kothara. Hi. Hi, um, so one question I had was um I know this model is generally or there's like assays used for developing um like models for predicting thermal stability and I know in um Gabe Brocklin's papers he uh like has used it like he service display to like engineer uh, small peptides could this like display also be used to engineer small peptides or would the cDNA have some sort of effect in um I guess like adding as like a as a, a linker that would like increase thermal stability artificially. So would that be mm -hmm. a possibility or would that be um or would it be better to use e service display for that? Uh that's a great point. So the major advantage is that the for to conduct the e display based the proteolysis method, we need to use the PAX or cell solder. And that is kind of major limitation of the number of the uh, proteins that we can analyze in a one, uh, one experiment. So let's say that in each display method, we can just quantify up to around 50,000 uh, proteins in, at one time, because the, we don't, we can't kind of uh, perform the cell sorter for the whole day or a very long time. But uh, in contrast, in CDNA display method, the current limitation is just that kind of, so we successfully analyzed the, uh, up to around 900,000 uh, proteins at one time. But uh, that is a kind of not limitation due to the kind of method, but rather the the current limitation is kind of just the kind of thesis cost of the oligo or the uh, cost of the NGS. So there is kind of no, basically no limitation of the number of the uh, uh, protein uh, we can analyze at one time in terms of the method itself. So that is a kind of major advantage of the CDNA display method. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And I was wondering, is there any, um, what's it called, work collaboration to try to uh, develop oligos that like are cheaper? So I know like there's limitations on the size of oligos pools. So like, is there any collaboration to try to develop, like, uh, use any like larger pools, like, larger oligos? <laughs> so the, 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 I, I think that the only problem or issue is the kind of cost. So we, if we can get kind of more grant, we can purchase the more large, kind of larger uh, oligo pool. So if so, we can analyze more data. But uh, on the kind of other issue is that currently we just use kind of DNA oligo as a template and we don't kind of assemble the oligo. So the current limitation, also the length, the, the currently that we can only uh, analyze up to around 80 amino acids because the, the longest oligo we can currently kind of easily purchase is up to around 300 nucleotides. So that is also the kind of future issue or uh, future uh, topic we want to uh, we, we want to kind of tackle in the future, I guess. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, very nice talk. I wonder if you could go just two slides back where you had the correlation between amino acid pairs. Uh, wait a sec. Just two slides from where you are right now back, I think, roughly. Like this one? Yeah, that would be the one. Yes, thank you. So I think you kind of did hear um, um, low-hanging... Uh, actually, that's not the one that that one was from a while ago. Anyway, the one that I'm referring to has uh, lots one? of other correlations. Yes, maybe a little bit forward. I thought it was very close to the end, like the one almost two or three slides from the end. Anyway, what I'm getting at is you you kind of did some low hanging fruit there like obviously there's going to be a correlation between positive and negatives for the reasons you said uh, ionic interactions it's obvious there's going to be two cysteines obviously for disulfide oh, bonds yeah uh but but there are some that that are equally interesting i think for example aspartate and histidine that also shows positive correlation i mean it's not bright bright red like like some of those that you highlighted and those are present in many many enzymes like in a catalytic triad enzymes you have basically an acid aspartate and a base histidine and then some something that does a nucleophilic attack or in many nucleases you have aspartate hydrogen bonding to a histidine which is also performing cleavage so actually i think you have many many more patterns there that you could correlate to to actual enzymes and actual proteins they're just not jumping at you exactly the same way like E to K correlation and some of these that you highlighted. I think there are many correlations there that you could rationalize by natural enzymes. Um, so actually I'm not sure because the, we just calculate the average and the most of the protein is not the kind of enzyme. And we don't focus on the kind of enzyme rather than we try to collect the kind of many, many uh, proteins. And also, I don't want to kind of focus on the like the uh, catalytic kind of trials or something else. So uh, I'm not sure if this kind of data represents the, such kind of complicated uh, amino acid interaction. But I just want to say that this is kind of global tendency of the amino acid compatibility shown in the previous literature. No, I, I fully. Your question? No, yeah, I, I realize that. I'm just saying that generally. Aspartate to histidine hydrogen bonding uh, in active sites, that's that's like happens all the time for all kinds of mm -hmm. enzymes. So mm -hmm. that's no surprising. I mean, that's still red, not as bright red like some mm -hmm. of the others. Yep, yep. But generally, patterns like that are going to be preserved, I'm sure, outside of active sites. They're not going to mm -hmm. be they're not going to be utilized just just in active sites. And I mean, your plot kind of shows that to be uh to be the case, I believe. Uh, I see. I see. Great talk, yeah, by the way. Interesting point. Thanks so much.
So there's a couple that are coming in on the chat. I can just read them to you, Kataro, if that's okay. Um, yep. So one question um, was wondering, while running hallucination design from TR Rosetta, what was the largest protein that you could design? Um, so I think we could design kind of very large protein using TR Rosetta or something else. But uh, as I said, uh, currently we can up to around 80 amino acids in our assay system. So we just, uh, uh, the maximum size of the hallucination design is around 80 amino acids, well, 72 amino acids. Awesome. And then we got another question asking, can this technology be adapted for transmembrane proteins? That's interesting point, but I'm not sure actually. So that I, if, uh, if I understand correctly, the transmembrane protein should be kind of embedded in the lipid. And I don't know if the protein can enter into the lipid, inside the lipid membrane and I don't think that they can cleave the kind of unstable transmembrane protein. So I, I, I think I don't, I don't think we can apply this method onto the transmembrane protein, but someone may kind of think about the kind of better way. Cool. Um, this question comes more from the paper. There's a section um, called influence of stability on evolution and um, Olivia found this very interesting and she wanted to know if you could comment on what might be the most important factors besides stability that goes into that favorability metric of evolution from that section. <laughs> Sorry, I actually don't remember that section, but uh, um, most important factors besides stability. So I think the most important point, other important point, as I said, uh, Protein is, of course, should have any function. So the function should be very important. So that's why they should be highly evolution conserved that not so important for the folding stability. So the, um, the folding stability is, of course, important, but the function should be more important than kind of folding stability. And also, the, as I said, the solubility also should be very important. Like the, uh, the natural protein doesn't always utilize, try to utilize the kind of best amino acid for, in terms of the folding stability, as I said, because the, if uh, amino acid, uh, if natural protein has so many hydrophobic amino acid, they should lose its proper solubility. So the, I think the function and solubility are also very important uh, along with the folding stability of proteins. Hopefully I can answer that question. <laughs> Yeah, another question that I see in the chat from uh, Stephen asks, how does the measured stability account for some proteins having more than one functionally relevant uh, conformation? And thus they may appear to be unstable when in transition between the states. Uh, that's good I can also read uh, that if you need it. Uh -huh. So the, in our assay, we actually assume the, the proteins in just in the two states. I mean, the unfolded state and folded state and no intermediate states. So if I understand correctly, if you want to, uh, to answer your question, we need to kind of, and also we want to analyze the kind of intermediate state between these states. And unfortunately, we couldn't kind of measure the, that kind of intermediate state in our assay because we need to assume the, uh, all proteins in the just two states, unfolded and folded state. Awesome. Does anyone else have any other questions that they'd like to unmute and ask? You can also put them in the chat, whatever you're feeling. Okay, one question that just came in is, how can one use the thermodynamic rules obtained here for rational or data-driven design? Um, so I think we can, so for example, uh, we utilize the kind of MPNN model to design amino acid sequence from the partial structure, but uh, we also, currently we have kind of this kind of data like the, 
we have the partial the relationship between the what amino acid is kind of best for the folding stability, and also we have the partial structure corresponding to that data set. So we if we want to utilize uh, so using this kind of data set, we should be able to uh, construct a model to design the amino acid significance that can be optimized for the folding stability, not for the kind of um, in terms of the best for the folding stability. But of course, the, we need also need to understand, uh, we need to also consider the solubility or other factors in the future to kind of make the better de novo protein. But uh, I think the, at least the, our data set should be kind of very useful to design uh, or kind of construct a deep learning model uh, that can design the amino acid significance uh, optimized for at least to, in terms of the folding stability, I guess. Hey, Cultural. Yes. Uh, thank you for the great talks. And I was interested in the kind of like principal component for PC for like mm -hmm. basic surface acid. But so you said like my net principal in PC for like basic amino acid is kind of like negative, but so acidic amino acid is, uh, aspartic acid is positive, but so not the glutamate is positive. Yep. Yes. Um, do you have any hypothesis? And also, like small amino acid is also important. And do you have any hypothesis? <laughs> um, uh, Sorry, I don't also, have any... is there any tendencies or like quality principal components, like tendency in the positions of the protein, like coalitions or surface lesions or something? Um, yeah, actually, I didn't region. kind of analyze in detail this data or this kind of in, in, from this kind of perspective, so I don't have any kind of right answer right now. But I'm not mm -hmm. thinking that this kind of principal component analysis highly depends on the, let's say, the data set itself. And mm -hmm. um, the currently we just got the data from PDB and we focus on the, let's say, the most of the data, let's say the um, derived from the, let's say the protein G or something else. So the data set may be somewhat kind of biased. So I don't think this is kind of very global tendency. And this aspartate may be kind of just derived from the kind of bias of the data set. So mm -hmm. I, I don't have the right answer yet right now, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah and something. Mm -hmm. So another question asked if um, someone asked, they might have missed this part, but can you describe the data that you use for the unfolded and unfolded and unfolded PR data? Is it from a database? Sorry, what, what do you mean by PR? It, it might have it might have been a typo and they might have meant for data. Let me see. Sorry, pro okay, protein. Protein. Yes. Do you um, want me to Got it. Hmm? So, what is protein data? So, um, actually, we couldn't kind of. So, I, sorry, I, I guess that you want to ask why we can assume that these two states, or sorry, could you this clear? Yeah, make they it wanted clearer? to. They wanted a description of the data that you use for the folded versus unfolded like protein data. Did it come from a database or was it only from experimental methods previously collected in the lab or where exactly were you getting like your folded versus unfolded data, it seems? I see. So um, we don't have kind of such kind of good data set, but to assume that these kind of two state we need to kind of check. So that's actually a very nice point. So to validate our data set, we need to kind of this kind of uh, um, single point mutants data so that we can validate the data set. Like the, some protein may be kind of aggregated and they look very stable, but they are just aggregated in one time. So we need to kind of confirm if the kind of core, uh, the hydrophobic amino acid at the core 
uh, is kind of very important for the stability for other things. So to kind of validate that data. So um, our assay is not kind of perfect and we cannot discriminate the how the, uh, the protein is actually in what kind of state uh, their protein is in uh, right now. So um, that's the point, I guess. Awesome. Another question was, how far are y'all from predicting directly from the amino acid sequence the mutations required to make a protein more stable? Um. Yeah, that's a good point. And <laughs> um, we are still developing such a kind of prediction model for the stabilizing mutants. And unfortunately, I cannot say anything because that is kind of collaboration project, so unfortunately, but I, we are on the good track, I guess. <laughs> awesome, we'll take a few more because we have a little bit more time, if that's okay. Um, uh -huh. Another question was, did you try to identify some universal features or descriptors for the folding critical positions um, and amino acids, such as distances between positions or other patterns that might be similar to that? Mm, that's kind of a difficult question, but uh, um, so as far as I noticed that, that for example, the in principal component analysis, this PC one is very major. Like the this PC one can explain the stability contribution, let's say around thirty or thirty five percent. So which means that hydrophobicity is very very important factor for the stability of the proteins. And indeed, we could confirm that hydrophobic amino acid at that core is a kind of very important. And this is not so surprising result, but uh, I, I think that generally the hydrophobic amino acid at the core is very, very important. Um, but unfortunately, we couldn't find out kind of very, uh, kind of very interesting insight, in, let's say in terms of the hydrophilic amino, amino acid interaction, like the salt bridges or a uh, hydrogen bond network within the core region. So that's also the kind of good future work, I guess. Another question that came in asked if this method could be applied to post-translationally modified proteins, such as ubiquinated proteins. Uh, that's a great point. Unfortunately, we are using the prokaryotic, I mean the E. coli-based translation system. So we cannot introduce any post-translational uh, modification in this system. But uh, theoretically, we can utilize the, um, the eukaryotic uh, translation system. Uh, so if so, we can introduce such kind of post-translational modification. But the issue is that we need to utilize the CDNA display method. And the CDNA display method, of course, we need to decode the DNA sequence. And that that DNA sequence don't have a, doesn't have any kind of post-translation information. So that may be kind of somewhat difficult. We need to kind of add some kind of more kind of uh, clever technique in the future, I guess. Awesome. I have two, two, uh, two more for you, if that's okay, before we wrap up today. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So the first one is, can this same method be used for thermostability rather than general stability? Um, stability. Sorry, I, I don't know what is the difference between thermostability and general stability. I, I think that I should ask this to the kind of directly the person that question posted, I guess. Yeah, I'll see. We can move on to the second one real quick, and I'll see if they can give some follow up yep. insight. Yep. That's totally fine. Um, so the second question was how how proportional between the protease resistant and stability would there be the same air rate air range, and how big would that air range be? Uh, that's great point. So of course. Uh, we need to kind of use some trick to convert the uh, protease resistance to the folding stability data. But I need to say that uh, our current kind of uh, pipeline should be very kind of accurate and our delta G should be very reliable because as I said, uh, we could see kind of very nice consistency between our data and previous methods. And secondly, I would like to show you the, another data so I'm not sure. Uh, we actually utilize two orthogonal proteases, uh, trypsin and chymotrypsin. And trypsin basically targets the lysine and the arginine. 
while the chymotrypsin targets the aromatic amino acid. And we uh, import the delta G from trypsin experiments and delta G from chymotrypsin experiments. And basically, we could see kind of very high consistency between them. So which means that our delta G should be very accurate and reliable. But of course, we need to kind of carefully uh, think about that point in the future as well. OK, and it looks like the first question actually got answered already through the, through already. the just targeted. <laughs> so it know. seems like, yeah, so it seems like that kind of helps. So I uh -huh. think thanks so much for your help. Yeah, I think that is all the questions, unless anyone has any last minute burning ones. Cool. Well, if not, I just want to thank you again, Kataro, for being with us. Thanks so much for accommodating this time to be with our audience today and for sticking around for um, questions. So we'll see everybody um, at our next talk. Thank you guys so much. Thanks so much, Mark. Thank you.